I'm Avery Haynes and welcome to Health on the Line. Ryan and Jeffrey are two young brothers who share one of the most misunderstood and unusual of syndromes. They can't control some of the noises that come out of their mouths and can't stop some of their movements. On today's show, Tourette syndrome. We'll find out how it's diagnosed and treated. We'll shatter some of the myths surrounding Tourette's and meet a therapist who has the syndrome himself and helps families cope. But first, meet the McKinnon family. I have three boys, aged 15, 12, and 10. Their names are Ryan, he's the oldest, Alex is um, 12, and Jeffrey is the 10-year-old. We first noticed um, with Ryan um, symptoms, I would say probably when he was around the age of three. When he was a baby, he started not sleeping properly. When he was about a year old, the first time he really had a rage, he was just over three and we were really unsure of what it was or what it was about. It was very beyond anything that I thought was normal and um, consequently he started having those quite, quite frequently um, and it wasn't anything that we could bring closure to. It, it would be like he would go through, through a certain series and he had to do those things before he could bring closure to it himself. But we always would know that he was done because he would cry he would be crying at the end of it. I would take him to the doctor, but he would be so quiet after. Um, I don't think anyone really believed me at first. I think that Jeffrey, he started making um, sniffing noises and kind of snorting noises when he was probably about four. But we never really thought anything of it. I think we were just so focused on Ryan because he was um, very high maintenance. Ryan has had a, probably more um, a wider range of series of ticks than Jeffrey has. Um, Ryan started with um, jerking his head to the side and nodding it forwards. Probably by grade one, he had a um, he started with a spitting tick that um, it has always plagued him. He um, throat clears and snorts. <coughs> he does a repetitious thing. <coughs> he would always have to jump up and touch the top of our one door. Um, and he could never pass through it, ever, without doing that. Jeffrey's got a lot of facial tics. Um, his are mostly facial tics. Um, he takes some medicine to try and help settle some of that. Um, he stretches his face. He, he big time pulls at his eyes like that. A lot of blinking. He sniffs sometimes. Um, that was one of his earlier ones. He sniffs so bad we used to call him Mr. Sniffy going places, traveling is a big problem for Jeffrey. Um, my husband and I decided one year to take a small trip because we hadn't been away a lot and we went to um, their favorite uncles in Windsor and um, we spent a couple of days and then we took them to Niagara Falls and at the point of leaving his uncles Jeffrey wouldn't eat. He does not like to eat at other people's houses. Um, he will for some reason eat McDonald's but not always will he eat it in McDonald's. Ryan wasn't one to really have friends. He could get along with very young children, um, but he could not get along with peers and kids his own age, absolutely not. He just didn't really fit in with them. He didn't know the same things they did. He doesn't, um, he doesn't have the same knowledge that everybody has and takes for granted of having. He doesn't do those connections the same. So people don't understand that. Ryan doesn't have boundaries. He walks right into your space, always has. Um, becomes a big issue to other people that don't understand that or don't know him. Finally, um, the doctor sent us to see a psychiatrist to see if he could help us manage Ryan a little better. And joining me now in studio is Valerie McKinnon and her two sons, Ryan and Jeffrey. Thanks to all of you for coming in. You're yep. welcome. Watching that piece and, and having a chance to see you guys before the show started, I didn't, there's not a real sense of Tourette syndrome. We don't see what the, the things that we normally would think of with Tourette syndrome in the kids. Um, I, I think at times that um, when there's other people in the house um, that they're unsure of who they are, they contain themselves somewhat, um, those sort of things. Um, if they're around their regular friends or we have, you know, people that regularly come into our house or they're going to families, friends, it's, it's much more noticeable. Um, they have tendencies to contain themselves at school and um, then they're quite, 
hard to manage when they come home from school. Because like it's a that. matter of suppressing it all day or suppressing That's it in right. situations where you're not feeling mm -hmm. comfortable. Ryan has had periods where he's actually asked us, um, I'm going somewhere and I don't really want to do that. He, we were going to a hockey game with a lot of family and um, it was difficult for him. And um, so we worked out a seating arrangement for him. He had a stress ball that he used to squeeze. Um, we attempted to behavior manage some of his tics that way. Um, hence he does this sometimes and taps on things and he's just moving a tick and just refocusing to something else. He used to sometimes snap elastic bands. At school they would give him plaster scene to walk around with just to try and contain himself. Do you guys feel as though you're, you're trying to suppress or hold back some of the ticks and stuff now? Mm, no. A little bit? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit? Because it's, it's in an uncomfortable situation a bit? And then at, what happens after you suppress for a while and then you, re, and then you leave here, what will happen? Does, does it all come like a ton at once? That's generally what happens, yeah. right? Yeah, Je Jeffrey's very much show up in behavior situations for him. Um, like what? He's just very hard to manage. Um, if I say black, he says white. Um, he'll tell you that he's hungry. But anything you offer him isn't anything he wants, but he doesn't know what he wants. So if you attempt to try and help him, it just seems to be a period of time, and then he settles down after a while. And in terms of, you, you know, you were mentioned that you first noticed signs at the age of three in Ryan. Very much so. That was the first time he started having rages, and we really didn't know what they were. Because, ra you know, I'm thinking, when I'm thinking rages, I'm thinking of a three-year-old and my own three-year-old having the temper tantrums. I mean, how mm. did you know it was different than a, than a um, normal temper tantrum? Kind of the course that it took. It seemed to take too long. He could sometimes be two hours trying to settle himself down. So, and some of the things that, that he would do weren't things that I thought were in line with a typical temper tantrum. Like what? Um, he, we, we had a room because Ryan, his playroom was set up with buckets and um, everything was sorted because Ryan couldn't sort things. He could not make sense of those sorts of things. So he couldn't find something. He'd be very frustrated. He would empty all the buckets. One time, um, he was really upset. I don't know what for. Because they would be minor things, something that someone else would go, hmm, and it would slide off your back. It would not for Ryan. Um, he took a, a fire truck, and he just kept throwing it from one end of the room to the other when he was about. He would have been, a, he would have been around four or five, and um, he was quite ferocious. And he was a very petite child, so we would always look at him and think, wow, like, how could something that small be so... I mean, he could throw things around that I wouldn't think a child his size would be able to. And Tourette's usually doesn't come on its own, and your kids suffer other, there are other That's right. things that come along with it. Yeah, Ryan, I mean, Ryan, Ryan after the rages, he started with throat clearing and, and, and snorting and those things. We did think <coughs> it was allergies, um, heavy eye blinking, those sort of things. Ryan has um, OCD behaviors. Obsessive, obsessive compulsive. compulsive. Yeah. Um, how does that manifest itself? How do you um, see that? He, he gets certain things stuck in his brain. Um, we were discussing with his, his doctor. Um, he has time things stuck in his brain. Eight o'clock is a time for him. He seems to think, I need to go to bed now. It's eight o'clock. And he gets up early in the morning to go to school, but even on the weekend. And even if he's not tired, he, he then starts to fret back and forth, back and forth. Should I go to bed? Should I not? Um, those sort of things. Um, Certain things trigger things in his, in his brain. If he hears the shower go off, he has to go in the bathroom. It doesn't matter who's in there. It doesn't matter how they would prefer him not to be there. Um, if the door is locked, he'll unlock it. He just, I, I'm, I'm going in there. And also attention deficit disorder is mm -hmm. also one of the difficulties. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan has that, I would say that part of him somewhat waxes and wanes, not so with Jeffrey. He's, um, he's very ADHD. He's all over the place at times. Um, mm -hmm. Very hard to focus. Um, he just loses, <laughs> oh, yeah. What he, yeah, he loses what he's doing and he's, it's difficult for all of them when Jeffrey's into those. Do you guys ever get a sense that you're different? I mean, did you ever feel before you got told that you had Tourette's syndrome that, that could, did you understand why you were doing some of the things you were doing? Or did it seem kind of kind of weird and scary to you? I don't know. I just did them. Did it feel as though as though you realized that there was something different between you and other kids in your class? And in terms of in terms of the classroom and being at school, um, 
Ryan was always, um, he was always um, in what they call a home school. So he was in a quieter classroom and then he would move in and out of the regular classroom. Mm -hmm. um, the moving in and out never worked for him. Um, Jeffrey, he, he's in a regular classroom. Um, academically, Jeffrey's um, just a bit behind. Six months to a year they consider behind in his schoolwork. Ryan's very behind. Um, academically, that's a big problem for him. And you have a middle child, which is a scary thing to have to yeah. begin with, and your middle child doesn't have Tourette's syndrome. He does not. He's, no, um, no he's a Sorry. very dependable boy. Yep. It's difficult for him. Um, he's got an older and a younger sibling that both want different things out of him. So, um, And of course myself as well. Like He's very dependable if we're going somewhere when, we were, when the kids were small. Um, if Ryan was having problems being in a store or that sort of thing, Alex would always say to me, well, I'll be really good. But he was always like that anyways. We considered him our couch potato. Um, He's just um, yeah, well-rounded, good boy. And we'll talk a little bit more about the difficulties yeah. of the kid who doesn't have the problems that the other kids do yeah. in just a moment. We do have to take a break. Please stay with us. When we come back, we'll meet a doctor who treats both Ryan and Jeffrey. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, to be officially diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome, a person has to have a number of physical and vocal tics for at least one year. And one man who helps in the diagnosis as well as the treatment is psychiatrist Dr. Paul Sandor, the director of the Tourette Syndrome Clinic at the University Health Network in Toronto. Thanks so much for being here. We hear about Tourette's syndrome, yet so few people know exactly what it is. Does, the, does medical science know what's happening inside of the brain of someone who has Tourette's syndrome? Well, we know some things about it, not as much as we would like or need to know. Uh, we know one thing, that there is too much dopamine. There are a number of chemicals in the brain that we use, our neurons use to communicate with each other. One of these is called dopamine, and there is too much of it. Uh, why do we know that? We know that because uh, uh, giving medications okay. that decrease the activity of this chemical tends to suppress ticks. So can you talk to me a little bit then about what sort of treatment you have done with these boys in terms of the medical as well as the psychological? Well, I think that the first uh, thing that probably was helpful for them as well as the family is to simply find out what is going on. And uh, as many parents who are struggling with children who are doing difficult to understand things, they begin to doubt themselves as parents. And also, uh, they don't know quite what to do and how to uh, respond to certain behaviors. Well, and you had mentioned as well that if you were taking the kids into doctors and they were sort of thinking as though you were off, off, your, off your rocker, I mean, that you didn't know uh, these kids That's were right. doing nothing when you took them into the office. That's right. I had, I had one doctor tell me that when Ryan was uh, about four and a half that, well, when he was seven, he probably just wouldn't do that anymore. It's interesting that he would choose the age seven because it tends to be when the ticks start, isn't it? Yes, yeah. usually ticks begin around age seven, although the range is wide. Mm -hmm. It can start as early as age one or two, and uh, sometimes later, around 12, 13, up to 18. But uh, most of the kids start around age seven. So in terms of the treatment then, and the recognition of the, of the syndrome as being the, the primary thing to realize, okay, now at least we know what we're dealing with, what do you do then? Well, uh, I certainly explain uh, about the condition to the extent that they understand that some of these behaviors are involuntary. Uh, they then have a different response to it. Uh, one of the factors that makes the ticks worse is stress. If the family reacts in a way that makes the child stress, so you're being bad, don't do it anymore, they can't stop it. And as a result, they have two contradictory pressures. One is the pressure to take, the other one is the, pr the injunction from the parents, don't do it. So they actually have more of a uh, tendency to take. When the family realizes what's going on, they back off and often, in fact, the takes decrease just because of that. They feel more comfortable then at home. 
what sort of medications are available to people with Tourette syndrome? Well, there are a few uh, uh, classes. The one we usually start with is called clonidine, uh, and that's the milder medication which tends to have only minor adverse effects <coughs> and often can help both takes and attention. Does it, does it reduce the level of dopamine that's being secreted? Is that what it does? Uh, it doesn't work directly on that, but indirectly it may uh, be doing so. It, in fact, uh, is a stimulant of uh, presynaptic norepinephrine receptors. It gets oh, complicated. Sure. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know, do you understand that one? No, nope. I don't think uh, <laughs> it's easy to explain uh, just uh, like that. But it does ultimately lower the dopamine activity. And probably. is that what these boys are both on? I don't think so, not anymore. Well. This is the thing that we first try. And as I said, because it is uh, milder and it tends to help several things, the attention takes as well as sleep. Many of the children with Tourette syndrome have trouble getting to sleep, and I think uh, Jeffrey and Ryan had that difficulty. Is that, a tr is that trouble when it's bedtime and try to go to sleep? Not anymore, not for me. What, when it was a problem, what was happening? Oh, I was up late, couldn't sleep, was in my room doing stuff. And just couldn't sort of get your brain to slow down? No. So when uh, clonidine is not helpful, uh, as it is unhelpful in 50-60% of the cases, uh, we uh, are forced to use more potent medications, and those are the ones that directly block dopamine receptors. The first one that was used in this uh, way was called haloperidol, and it was in use for a good 20, 25 years, and we still use it sometimes now. Others are, that we now use more often include risperidone, olanzapine, and uh, are, are these kids others. on drugs for the rest, of, uh, the rest of their lives, or as long as they continue to show, to show have the, the ticks and the difficulties? Well, maybe the first thing is I should point out that not everyone who has Tourette syndrome requires medication. Only about, I would say, 15, 20 percent of those that have the symptoms come to medical attention. So they, it's simply because they've been undiagnosed or because they don't need the medication? Well, uh, usually it's because the symptoms are mild enough that don't cause so much trouble as to cause them to seek help. What are some and of the adverse effects of, of the medication that the, that the boys are on? Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, some of the most uh, frequent adverse effects are weight gain, feeling tired, uh, sometimes it leads to tremors or stiffness or restless feelings. And uh, I don't know, do you have any of those? Mm, no. Jeffrey no. gets the tired feeling the most. Usually we try to start with a very small amount of the medication mm. and gradually increase to the point where it works without having uh, the adverse effects. Usually we can do that. Sometimes it's difficult to find it area, <laughs> the dosage which does the job without producing too much in the way of side effects. When we talk about the drugs though, was there ever a debate about whether or not to put the boys on drugs or was there a sense that, that, that they could possibly do without? Um, when we went the medicine route for Ryan it was because it was his choice. Um, he was tired of spitting all the time and doing those things. And, and it was stopped with the medication? That, because you would, um, it would spit into a towel right at school. I would say he's, it, it, it helps it enough that he can control it, it, it is not gone. Um, he just can control it and suppress it, it just makes it easier for him to do that sort of thing. If he's inside he doesn't necessarily, but he will just go outside and do it. But when he's outside he spits quite continually. Okay. Yeah. We do have to take a break, but when we come back you'll meet an amazing man who despite having Tourette syndrome has earned a PhD in psychology. Please stay with us.
welcome back. About 1% uh, of the population has Tourette uh, syndrome. For some reason, boys are three times more likely to get it than girls. Our next guest, Duncan McKinley, works with families coping uh, with Tourette's at the Bloorview Macmillan <coughs> Centre in Toronto, and he has first-hand knowledge of some of the challenges. Thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. And it's interesting, when I first uh, met you, the, the, the ticks at, and, the, and the noises at first can be really distracting, and then we were saying it's amazing how you know, five minutes later it completely <coughs> leaves as being a distraction. It, it's, it's, it's really something. I, I don't understand it myself because with the associated disorders that go along with Tourette's, and I have a lot of distractibility. And I, don't, I don't know if I can handle me. But, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's funny how quickly people just tune it out. And, and I know that I, I've had a lot of friends along the way, along the journey that have really helped me. And, and one was, was, was someone who told me that you know, I'm not noticing your tics anymore. You, you should stop talking about them all the time. You're more worried about them than I am. We're not uncomfortable to you. Make us uncomfortable by making a self-deprecating joke or what have you. So just cut it out. We, it's, 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 not, it's a non-issue. When did you first realize How? that you had Tourette's syndrome and <laughs> when were you initially diagnosed? Well, th those are two very different dates. Um, I knew something was going on by age seven and I was diagnosed at age 19. And, and there was a period in there where um, I, I did my best to really not think about what was happening. It seemed, it seemed too big of an issue for, for my little brain to deal with. There, there seemed to be something really wrong and, and strange and different about me and, and, and unacceptable. The, um, I, I'm, I'm fairly unapologetic about my tics now, and I, and I tick <laughs> quite, quite freely. But um, at, at, at the time, any, any time a little bit slipped out, I seemed to get such a massive reaction, an ostracization or, or ridicule or, or getting grilled by my, by my family or what have you, that I just did the math and thought, well, if they're reacting that much to this, uh, I'm not going to show them the whole package. And what a horrible huh. way to spend your childhood, though, this feeling that you had this, this terrible secret inside that there's no way you could get out. Well, and... and what I've come to realize is that did a lot more damage that can cause a lot more scars and, and a lot more trouble than, than, than the symptoms possibly ever could, which is one of the reasons why I let my, my symptoms out fairly freely now. The, the more I found that I suppressed in my tics, the more the associated stuff came up, the more compulsive and obsessive I got, the more um, irritable and, and, and rage prone I was. And, and, and these are things that, that, that obviously um, ironically can cause you know, many more issues al along your life path than, than simply ticking. Like ticks, while they're pretty benign, um, are, are really out there for everyone to see and they're really bizarre and really different. And so the last thing you want to show um, would be really the best thing to show. It's interesting that when you're talking, you're not ticking at all, but the minute you stop talking and I'm asking you a question, the ticks start, right? Is it yeah. something about me? <laughs> Actually, yes. I want to talk to you about You want to talk to me about um, it. Anyway, um, a good, way, a good way to think of, of, of any of the symptoms, the tics, the, the wandering attention, the, 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 the compulsions, they're almost like, like bleed-off valves for this extra um, disinhibited energy. And what I mean by disinhibited is that, that it, it's not well-contained, it's not well-centered. You have leaky brakes. And uh, so what happens is that if I'm doing something like presenting or juggling or drumming, it's not that I'm suppressing my symptoms at that time, it's just that doing a task like this is very disinhibiting in itself. It takes a lot of energy, you're doing a lot of things simultaneously, and so all that extra energy running around up there like a bored little kid looking for something to do and getting in trouble gets directed. You give it a job, you channel it. And so it, it, it's, it's like everyone when they present or, 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 or juggle or, or drum or what have you needs this much energy. I just have this much energy all the time. And so given that, I've learned to accept that and go, okay, well, let's, let's do something productive with it. One of the things that we were talking about before the break was the decision of whether or not to medicate. And I guess there is some debate on that. Well, I think that uh, Duncan is a very good example. He has a lot of symptoms by any measure and yet he has found a way to live with them and does not find them distressing. It's a question of whether <coughs> the symptoms cause distress, whether they interfere with life of the individual, and then weighing, weigh this uh, against the possible side effects of the treatment. When the balance is favorable, the decision to treat uh, is made, and we always start with a small amount of medication and look, uh, reassess frequently to make sure 
that the treatment, the cure is not worse than the disease. Because, because you have decided, you, you tried medication and you decided against it. Right. And um, I, I should make clear, too, that um, to, to medicate or not to medicate doesn't necessarily mean to treat or not. That, that there are a lot of strategies, there are a lot of um, cognitive behavioral techniques, different um, psychology um, strategies and, and, and tricks and, and, and tools that, that I use to, to make sure that I'm still responsible for my behavior and I still get done what I, what I need to get done and, and reach the goals that I want to reach. Um, in, in, in terms of medication, I think that it becomes very much a philosophical choice and, and certainly an individual one where you ask yourself, is what I'm getting rid of worth also what I'm losing? Because the thing about these disorders, when you have this extra energy, it's like everything about you is magnified. Everything's, it's an amplification of self. And while we as doctors tend to focus on the negative and, 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 and want to treat and get rid of this, there's a whole other side of the coin. There's all these positives that are also amplified, not in spite of the fact that you have Tourette's, but because of the fact you have Tourette's, you have these different gifts. And so um, you, you, you need to decide personally um, which, which, which fork in the road am I going to take? Like, um, do, do, do I want to suppress everything and, and sacrifice those positives? Or can I live with the negatives and maybe reshape them and, and, and channel things more appropriately and, and, and work with all this energy? So it's sort of, you know, am I going to express it or am I going to suppress it? And in terms of... It's important to know huh. that uh, these uh, <laughs> symptoms can come in a very broad range of severity. Some people just have a few frequent eye blinks and a sniff while others have a little more, and there are some who have a lot more than Duncan. And obviously, those people would be much more likely to wish for treatment. It, because it all would depend on the severity of it. I mean, if you, as you're mentioning, if you've just got a few little blinks, it's not going to be an issue that, that you're dealing with. We do have to take a break, but please stay with us. We'll have more when we come back on, on the strain that Tourette's can put on families, including the McKinnons. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, along with Tourette's syndrome comes isolation, frustration, anger, fear, and a lot of ignorance from the outside world. Dr. Sandor and Duncan help families cope after the diagnosis. And, I, and I'm wondering, Duncan, when, when families are coming to you, uh, all those emotions wrapped up, what, what do you do to sort of help them cope with this? There, there's a lot of important aspects. I think, first okay. of all, education is key. There's so many misperceptions that, that, that can take place, not only in, the, in, in the family members and in, in peers and in the classroom, but in the individual themselves. The feeling yeah. that they can somehow can, can control it <coughs> and that they're doing it to bug you, right? I mean, yeah. that's the, the thing with kids. You must have felt that way initially before the diagnosis came through. Um, yeah. <coughs> I, I used, I used to, to feel that a lot with Jeffrey. Just like, oh, why is he doing that? Um, very focused on Ryan. So we already had a diagnosis with Ryan and really didn't look at Jeffrey as the possibility that we might have another child. We have a middle child who is fine. So never really just even considered that as part of it. Um, and that's one, of the, that's one of the sort of hurdles that you have to overcome as a parent, right? And, and, and as an individual with Tourette's yourself, that one of the... One of the places where my, my own frustration came from, my own lone frustration tolerance, was that I felt like I was fighting the same battles that my mom was. That I didn't know where it was coming from either. I didn't yeah. seem to be the person I wanted to be. And whatever it was I was trying to be, the opposite came out. And I very much felt like there was someone against me too, except he was invisible. He was up here. Mm -hmm. I felt very persecuted. Like, whenever there was a tick that I really, really hated, that was the one that I did ten times more. And it was like there was this devil up there that, 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 that really wanted to get me. <laughs> You're smiling. It sounds like you can, you can relate. Yeah, you can. And, and so the, more, the reason I say education is key is because the more you learn about it, the, the more you can sort of make friends with that guy up there. Because yeah. you realize, oh, you know, he's not out to get me. He's just like 
like I say, a little bored kid running around up in your head. And if you're thinking about something a lot, he's going to be goofing around over there too. And so mm -hmm. the less you think about a tick, for example, the less you mm -hmm. let it get to you, the less emotion you put behind it, the less you do it. So there are ways to deal with your ticks, just yeah. not necessarily the most intuitive ones. And in terms, of getting, in terms of getting schools and, and kids to sort of understand what you're going through, I mean, you had a tough time in school. I did. Um, and you were suppressing 99% of the ticks, well, that, right? and, that, and that's why I was having a tough time in school. I think, the, the, first of all, sometimes you can be paying poorly, uh, be, be paying attention poorly in class, not because you necessarily have a very pronounced case of ADHD, but simply because you're, you're, you're sticking your fingers into the, 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 the holes in that proverbial dam, trying to keep the, the onslaught from coming forth. And so you're spending all of your energy over here instead of on the calculus lesson or whatever. So um, I certainly, I was my own worst enemy. Um, I made a lot of assumptions that I wouldn't make now and that I, I try to make sure that kids don't make now. And, and one of my biggest assumptions was that I knew that other people would hate me as much as I hated myself if they found out what I had. And that wasn't true at all. I wasn't giving people a chance to understand. Of course they were laughing. I didn't tell them what was going on. And, and so a lot of what I do now are, are, are presentations, including in classrooms, where you know, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal how great kids can be if you just give them the opportunity to be. I, I really want you two guys to see this. There, there was a boy that I, I did a presentation for that was petrified. He thought that his, parent, or his, his parents understood, but that other kids wouldn't understand and that they'd, they'd lose all their friends. And what happened is that day they got walked home with a whole bunch of new friends and they were because going out to movies that night. Because you went into the classroom and explained what Tourette's syndrome was. <laughs> right. And, and then you got this letter? And, and, and the kids just sort of said, oh, that's why you're doing that. Okay. So it says, to Jonathan, it probably was hard for you to tell us. Sorry for being not nice to you. We thought you were just trying to bug us, especially from the girls. We'll try to treat you better. Thanks for helping <coughs> us with spelling. Thanks for letting us know, and thanks for being a friend. I mean, that's got to make your, your job feel completely worthwhile when you get a letter like that. Well, and, and, and the weight of the world that's off your shoulders, once you know you don't have to hide anything, and once you know your worst fears aren't true, they're not going to lock you up. They're not going to hate you. They can't tease you anymore because you've, you've taken them away their material. Um, when, when you get something like this, that even helps your symptoms. You're not ticking as much. You're not obsessing as much because stress very much impacts the severity of these symptoms. And so... You, you're not as stressed, and so you, you, you have the problem. Have you guys had a, a, any problems with bullies at school? No. No one's picked on you, or no. when you had the spitting towel, they didn't make a big deal mm, about that? No, not really. Not that I can remember. Mom? Not when he was in the younger grades. As he got into the older grades, yeah. He, he was ostracized from certain situations or playing with kids. He never really had anyone at school that would actually play with him. Um, he used to shadow his brother around, which would become a situation. Um, friends were, you know, his friends were unwilling to accept his brother because he was older. Um, so he's, I would say Ryan struggled a lot with um, friends. Jeffrey's um, somewhat able to make friends. Um, Get annoyed You've made with a friend him after me. a while. He's a little <laughs> yeah. over here. Well, most of his friends are the girls in his class. Well, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Two boys. Two boys and a couple, and the girls are all are all after you, are they? Do they chase you and try to? Well, no, okay. Well, no chasing somewhat. in the schoolyard. Yeah, allowed. <laughs> we do have to take a break, but when we come back, how the person with Tourette's ah. copes in the outside world. Please stay with us. <laughs> If you have a health story you'd like to share with us, you can email us at hotl at discoveryhealth.ca or you can also send a letter by snail mail.
welcome back. Well, the ticks, the vocal noises, the compulsive behavior can all be very distracting and even scary for other children and adults. We'll focus now on how to become more comfortable with Tourette syndrome. And I think, Duncan, you know, you'd mentioned before about what you do in the classroom. But in terms of, I mean, you've got a PhD. Huh. You're on the verge of becoming a, psych a full-fledged psychologist. What? Scary. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not at all. But I, when, you're, when you're going through school. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you're naughty. When you're going through school, and you're going and you're in the workplace environment and also in your social <coughs> life. I mean, you're dating a woman. Does it be, when does it become so big of an issue or, or how do you make it not become such a big issue? Well, I think part of it is your own projection that um, if, if, if your body language is sending the message, I think this is a big deal. I'm, I'm mortified about this. I don't think I'm good enough because I shake my head or stick my tongue out or bark or what have you. Then people sort of follow suit. Whereas if, if, if you're walking down the street and, and you look okay with yourself and you are confident and, 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 you, and, and you act as if it's irrelevant, then, then other people pick up on that as well. But do you, did you ever have a difficulty in people taking you seriously? <coughs> In like, did it, did, does it ever, did, did you ever feel as though it detracted from your, your mental ability that someone would think as though somehow you weren't fully in control? I think, sir, I, I can think of a couple of different times when I've been in, um, say, like, excuse you, uh, in a, like a video store where um, people are very openly talking right next to me about what I'm doing because there's maybe an assumption that, that, that there's a developmental delay there, that, that intellectually I'm, 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 I'm at a deficit because I'm doing all these different things. Do you things. carry your little PhD around and pull it out and show them? <laughs> Here's my card. Um, I think I, I've got a pretty good sense of humor about this stuff now, and, and I think the most important lesson I learned was I started to realize that 99.9% .9 of people out there just don't know what's happening. It's, it's not that they're mean. It's not that they want to make you feel bad about themselves, uh, about you. It's, it's just that um, when they jump or they laugh or they, or, they, or they turn away or cross the street, they just don't know what else to do. It's like getting a test blank. Like, I, I don't have a file in my head to tell me what to do with what you just did. That's right. And, because, and it's so, because it is so <laughs> unusual. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, doctor, was how you help people understand who don't have Tourette syndrome what it's like. Well, uh, it's... Uh, uh, many of the ticks are a response to an internal urge. It's like the, it's an itch. <laughs> and one way you can try it on is simply by trying not to blink. The longer you hold it, you can do it for a while, but the longer you hold it, the stronger the urge to blink becomes. And that urge you experience is very similar to what people with Tourette syndrome experience before some of their ticks. And in fact, blinking is one of the most common ticks. One of the earliest. Do people outgrow Tourette syndrome? Can you outgrow it? The best information we have is that about three quarters of the children and adolescents who have tics experience a great decrease in their symptoms. They are much better by the time they come out of their teens, say at the end of the high school. So sort of before high school or in, in the middle years of high school is when they peak and then they start declining? The peak seems to be around age 10 to 13. Statistically speaking, I mean, it could be different for individuals, but on average, it's around that time. Okay. We do have to take a break. When we come back, new research and treatments into Tourette syndrome. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, the signs of Tourette syndrome first start popping up, as we were mentioning, when the child is about seven years old, and yet it is usually much, much later before a diagnosis is made. Up until recently, the treatment has not been very effective, and I'm wondering where we are in terms now of, of treatment and research. So are, is there anything new on the horizon for treatment? Well, there, is always, uh, there are always <coughs> new medications that we are testing in terms of the ability to suppress symptoms of Tourette syndrome. And there are people working on that currently. There also there is a major effort to study the origin of this disorder, which is believed to be genetic. And there is a lot of uh, evidence to support that view. Well, and right beside you, or to, or, you know, it's a, yes. but, but the odd thing is that Alex, the middle child, not getting it, right? Well, 
Each child has <laughs> a, a big sigh of relief. <laughs> if one parent carries the gene, then each child has only a 50% chance of getting it. And a child who has Tourette syndrome, I mean, if, if Duncan, if you were to have children, mm -hmm. what are the odds that your child would have Tourette syndrome? Well, there's nothing that can be said for certain yet because we haven't specifically identified on, on the genome where, where exactly uh, Tourette's lies. However, the, the, the theory that fits the available facts the best at this point seems to point to the idea that it, it, there's more than one gene, like it's not just a dominant gene. And, and um, there's, a, th there's currently a theory where mom has a gene, dad has a gene, and um, in, in mom and dad, they have about a 50% chance of showing the gene or not. They, they may have a little bit of obsessive compulsiveness or a tad bit of anxiety or a little bit of dis distractibility or something. And if both of those genes are passed on to the child, it's almost like genetic Lego. It's uh, like an additive thing. It comes together and, you know, out I pop. <laughs> are you worried, though, about having kids? <laughs> I'm not. Um, I, th I think that I've learned... The Tourette's is a quality of myself, that just like height or hair color, or whatever, that I can lament the negatives or I can really run with the positives. And, and it does bring a lot of benefits to it. And I would be, I would, I would, I know that I would be a good parent if, if I had a child with Tourette's because I, 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 would, I would certainly be able to empathize and, and, and teach him or her a lot of the tricks that it took me years to figure out on my own. I can, I can sort of, uh, you know, let them in on the secrets early on. And quite frankly, I don't know what I would do with a normal child. <laughs> be like, Dad, I just want to sustain attention on my math homework for the next five hours. Leave me alone. <laughs> Where are we in terms of research? I mean, there's obviously research being done on this, but in what, in what areas? Well, as I mentioned, genetics is an important effort. Uh, we collect families where there are more than two uh, children affected with Tourette syndrome. We need hundreds of them in order to be able to tr identify the more precise location of the genetic flaw or flaws, as Duncan mentioned. There are probably several different genes that are involved and together they may explain why somebody has only some symptoms and others have many more. Because there's no way, there's no brain scan that can be done, there's no, there's no blood test that can be done in terms of diagnosis, right? I That's mean, right. There, is, there are no tests right now to tell you whether you do or don't have Tourette syndrome. Uh, one of the first results of having the genetic uh, uh, cause identified would be to develop a... Uh, Huh. blood test, perhaps that would be able to tell us that. Okay, we do have to take a break in a moment, debunking some long-held myths surrounding Tourette syndrome, and Duncan has a little, a little certificate to give to the boys here. Huh. We'll have more on that in just a second. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Well, there is a lot of public ignorance and confusion surrounding Tourette's syndrome. And it's no wonder. Usually the only, the very extreme symptoms are the ones that are portrayed in the media. And now we're going to break down some of the myths that are out there. And one of the things, if you mention Tourette's syndrome to anybody, the first thing that they think about is the uncontrollable swearing or inappropriate. Why is that? Why is it that so closely associated with Tourette's syndrome? Well, I... Certainly when, when Tourette's was first written about back in 1885, that was one of the key symptoms that was recognized by Georges Gilles de la Tourette. So it, it, it sort of stuck around for that reason. But also I, I think a much simpler answer is it's very media friendly. <laughs> it's, because it's it, so outrageous. It, it, it is. And, but, and you can certainly get a lot of jokes out of it on, on shows like What About Bob and Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, and these sorts of movies can, can get a lot of uh, distance using that gag. But in terms of what, what comes out of the person's mouth, it's so, so usually there's a racial element to it and a sexual element to it. Huh. Are those people thinking those things? No, it's, it's sort of like the sticking your finger into the fan phenomenon. I mean, every once in a while, I understand that, that, that everyone gets odd little impulses. And it's usually the worst possible thing you could do in the situation. And you're, and you're mortified about it and you think, oh, geez, where, where did that come from? And, you, and you, you inhibit it. You put the brakes back on it. But because our brakes are faulty, usually the worst possible thing, the thing that's most alien to us, the, the, that causes us a lot of emotion and anxiety, is exactly the tick we're going to engage in. So slightly tongue-in-cheek, the, 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 the boy with Tourette's that's going to be swearing would be the minister's son. <laughs> 
because it would be so something that <laughs> would be completely. <coughs> It'd be so taboo that you know you're constantly thinking, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear, and that bored little kid in your head wanders over and goes, oh, what are you doing over here? Oh, gee, you don't want me to swear, eh? And and suddenly the itch starts. And what about this? I won't ask you because I don't want it to become a personal thing, Duncan. But what about what about this this idea that you don't when you're, during an orgasm you don't have any ticks? <laughs> well, I don't think that's uh, entirely true either. What's that? That's not true. Either. It's not true. Okay. Uh, so, uh, did you want to answer, Duncan? <laughs> Look, you're blushing. <laughs> Makeup. <laughs> uh, um, um, you brought some. Uh, you brought something that you wanted to give to the boys. I did. A couple of years ago, guys, I, I sat down and I thought, what did I really, really need to hear when I was your age? And, and I wrote those things down and I put them on a certificate that I want to make sure I give to you today. And, and there are three things on here. And they, and they, have, they, they have your names on them here. Okay. And uh, they say, so for example, Jeffrey and, and Ryan, because you live with Tourette's, not in spite of it, not even though you have Tourette's, because you have Tourette's, this means some special things. It means, first of all, you're an incredibly strong, sensitive, caring, creative, fun, quick, energetic, and overall great person. The second thing it means is that to do as well as you have, you need to work much harder than other people who've done that well. Yeah. You really need to give yourselves a lot of credit and a pat on the back because yeah. you're here. Look at you. Yeah. I wasn't talking about this stuff. I wasn't comfortable for another 10 years. You guys are going to be running the country by the time you're my age. Yep. <laughs> so everyone be warned. <laughs> Tourette's unite. <laughs> and, and the final thing it says on here is anyone would be lucky to have you as a friend. I really enjoyed meeting you guys today, and I can see all the positive qualities that things like Tourette's bring to a person. And, you know, whether your friends are old enough to recognize it or not, they will be. And whether and the girls are old enough to recognize it yet, they will be. And they will because Duncan has a girlfriend, so there's, there's your truth on that. I really enjoyed meeting you guys, too, and I want to thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. And thank you as well, Doctor. Thank and you. thank you so much for coming in, and Duncan as well. And I'd like to thank you for watching. I'm Avery Haynes, and we'll see you next time.